That's right. You got it. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Acts chapter 17 today? We're looking at Paul in Athens, Acts chapter 17. And uh, I want to begin reading in verse 15. Let me open in prayer and then I'll begin reading. Father, uh, we thank you so much that uh, we have your word, your holy word. We thank you, Lord, that it is living and active and speaks even today. So as we study about Paul's ministry in Athens and we look at the things that determine a success in ministry, that, uh, Father, you would speak to our hearts about it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin reading in Acts 17 and verse 15. It says, those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving instructions for Silas and Timothy to come to him as quickly as possible, they departed. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worship God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with him. Some said, what is this ignorant show off trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, may we learn about this new teaching you're presenting because what you say sounds strange to us and we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus saying, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through your temple, I saw idols to Zeus and Hera and Apollo and Domitian. And what really caught my attention was an idol that had this inscription, to the unknown God. Now the one you worship without knowing let me tell him about you. He is the God who created the world and everything in it. And since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he is the one who gives to all life and breath and all things. And he has made from one man, yes, he has made from one man all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. And he has determined their times and also the boundaries of where they should live. Now he did this so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they would reach out and feel for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets, Clematis and, and Aretas, have written, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we should not think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, some idol fashioned by man's devices and imaginations. Truly, God overlooked these times of ignorance, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent, for he has appointed a day in which he will judge all the world in righteousness by the man he has ordained. Now he has given proof of this by raising him from the dead. And I come to you as a witness, one who has seen the risen Christ. He is the Son of God, the Word of God made flesh. And if you will turn from your idols and put your trust in him and call upon his name, you can be saved. The scripture picks up and said, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead from Paul, some began to ridicule him, but others said, 
We'd like to hear from you again about this. And Paul left their presence. However, some people joined him and believed, including Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. You know, today everyone is concerned about success. I thought it was ironic, the skit that our children did. Uh, people look for approval and they try to bestow approval. And many times how we measure success is really not that accurate. In fact, as we look in the book of Acts, there are two uh, probably the most popular discourses. The first is found in Acts chapter 2 uh, as Peter is preaching at Pentecost, and the other is here at Mars Hill as Paul is speaking to intellectuals and speaking to people that are looking for the newest thing and the newest religion. And if we were to compare these two discourses, these two messages, we would say, well, Peter had a successful ministry because the scripture said that 3,000 responded. But we would look here at the end of our text today and just a few people, and we would say, well, Paul was not so much. I love how that skit brought out the point that we don't determine what success is, that we all have value because of whose we are and who we are, and that God himself uh, determines what success is. And so today, uh, as we look at uh, this message, I want to look at Paul's success in Athens. And it's something that's very important for us to know. And we'll draw this conclusion at the end. Success, when someone carries out the ministry of the gospel, is not determined by how people respond. Why is that? Because it's the Holy Spirit who draws people. In, in other words, you might be sharing with someone at work or in school, and you might plant that seed, and there may be someone later that will actually reap the harvest of that. It might take three, four, five contacts. And so we need to be very careful as we look at, at the book of Acts that we don't begin to categorize what success is in a way that is different from how God uh, would categorize it. And so today I want to look at five things that were true of Paul. <clears throat> These five things had to do with his heart. They had to do with his methodology. They had to do with uh, his motivation and we're going to see how each of these things point to the fact that Paul had a successful ministry here in Athens. The first thing I want you to note with me is that Paul had a burden for the people in Athens. He had a burden for them. I've been recently reading a book. It's written by a man named James Clear. It's called Atomic Habits. It talks about developing positive habits in your life and uh, removing things that are not good habits. And as he talks about uh, placing good habits in your life, he said it really starts with a cue. And a cue is the thing within a person that motivates the change. You're not going to develop habits if there's not a stirring within. And, and the point he brings out is that activity is really cued by our heart desire. I want you to see Paul's heart's desire here. He, he had a burden for the people. Look at verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens before he began to speak, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. In other words, his success as a minister of the gospel began in the heart. It began when his heart was stirred. I've seen a lot of people who've had a heart to carry out the ministry of the gospel, maybe to an individual or group of people. And I've talked with them after when they said, oh, if I just said it just like this, or I wish I'd gotten my words right, or I wish this would have happened. But you know, most all the time, that really doesn't matter because when God is working through someone who has a sincere heart, God is working. In, in other words, you don't have to get the words right. You don't have to be eloquent. You just have to be willing. And so entering Athens, it says that it began in the heart, that Paul was deeply distressed. This word distressed is the word uh, from which we get our English paroxysm. And it is really originally in the Greek, it was a medical term that spoke to toward seizures or toward uh, an unsettled state. And so Paul here was unsettled. It speaks uh, further to a provoking of the spirit or one being irritated. 
And, and so Paul, as he looked at all of the idolatry that was in Athens, something that he had not seen to that degree before during his two journeys, he began to be distressed when he saw a city full of idols. Well, why was that? There were really two things that motivated Paul's burden. The first was this, God was not getting the allegiance due to him. And if we're going to have a heart to share the gospel with people, we need to have a heart for people, but we need to have a heart for God, that God would be known in this person's life. And the second motivation is the people were ignorant about God. He really cared about these people. The way Jesus described as he looked out over Jerusalem, they were like sheep without a shepherd, and this distressed him greatly. And so the point being is this, Paul was agitated that the Athenians did not know Jesus Christ. And so if we're going to be a successful minister of the gospel, and when I say minister, I'm not speaking professionally, I'm speaking to every one of us. If we're going to be a uh, successful conveyor of the gospel, it begins in our mind understanding that Jesus is the only way. And Paul understood that in this area full of people who believed multiple false gods, but it also involves a stirring of the heart. We need that burden that Paul had. Lifeway Research surveyed uh, 2,000 unchurched Americans back in the year 2016, and they said uh, to these unchurched people, these people who, who didn't know the Lord, they said, would you be willing to talk about spiritual matters? And these people were open, 78% said, yes, we want to talk about spiritual matters. But it's very interesting that among that, that group, that only one third said that any Christian had ever talked to them about his or her faith. You see, sharing proceeds from a burden. Paul was distressed in spirit. There was a stirring within him that people would hear the gospel. But I want you to see a second thing. He wasn't limited to just the church building, we might say, or the synagogue. But Paul spoke of God within more comfortable religious environment and out beyond that. So where do we find Paul? It says in verse 17 that he begins in the synagogue. He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews, following that pattern uh, that to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. We see that here. And, and so a familiar thing. And, and he had things in common. Now, most of the people in the synagogue had not at that point believed in Jesus, but there was some common ground. The Jews were monotheistic. The Jews could understand the Old Testament law, so he could use that as a frame of reference to begin to share Christ. So there were things that he had in common with these Jews that made it somewhat easier to convey the gospel. And so he was sharing among those who could potentially believe. That's why it's so important in the church that we share the gospel in the church, that we share it where people are familiar, because they're not just children, but adults. There are many churches today who are removing the altar call of the time for people to respond. I don't think that sound biblically, because every time God's word is preached, we should give opportunity uh, for response. And so we see uh, that he did that there. But I want you to see that he moved beyond that. And, and my favorite commentary in Acts was written by a man recently passed away just a few years ago, John R.W. Stott. And in his commentary on it, he, he spoke how Paul actually preached Jesus in three distinct areas. First, the synagogue, which we're familiar with. The second is the marketplace. We see that again in verse 17, that he spoke not just in the synagogue, but as well in the marketplace. And then finally, to the Areopagus. Now, uh, the synagogue would be those who were familiar with Jehovah. And, and in the marketplace, these would be just casual passerbys, people. And in the Areopagus, that would be more like we might call a university or an intellectual setting. And each presented opportunities, but each presented challenge. In the synagogue, he had the challenge of 
preconceived notions of who God was. And so the Jews would say, we've not heard of this, this Jesus you're speaking about, we don't believe, we know there's a Messiah, but we uh, do not believe he is. And so you had the struggle of preconceived notions. In the marketplace, there was the struggle of people who were basically ignorant. In fact, it says here that he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection and the people out in the community there, they thought he was speaking about two foreign deities. They had no idea that the resurrection spoke of Jesus himself. But then there was the challenge of the Areopagus. They were willing to receive new teachings, but they challenged every one of them. There was the intellectual pride. But we see here that Paul was successful because he was willing to share. 1 Peter 3.15 says that we need to be ready at all seasons, wherever we are, to plant the seed of the gospel. We're going to look primarily at the Areopagus today, at this last group as we study how Paul shared. But I want us to see these first two things. Paul had a heart for people to come to know Jesus. Do you have that? Do you have a heart? Do you have a heart for your family members, for your coworkers? Not only that they themselves would benefit from knowing the Lord, but that God would be rightly glorified in their lives as Lord of all. But then secondly, Paul was willing to go wherever, not just in the comfortable confines of the walls of the local church, but beyond to do it. But then I want you to see a third truth that I believe qualifies him in God's eyes as being successful, that Paul was perceptive of his audience. He was alert and he was attentive to what was going on around him. I was discipled in personal evangelism by a a man that a number of you uh, in individuals know Ben Lehman. Ben was a tremendous impact on my life. He had an impact when I was at Southwestern Seminary. We used to go out on Monday evenings in Fort Worth and just knock on doors and share Christ with individuals and couples. And I remember Ben shared with me two things in his wisdom of experience of sharing in personal evangelism. He said, first, expect satanic opposition. He says, when uh, you're going to go out on a Monday night, you can guarantee Monday early in the day, you're going to stub your toes. Somebody's going to pull in front of you. You're going to be there at the home and ready to share about Jesus and some phone's going to ring or something's going to, somebody's going to scream. He said, you can almost expect it. But the second thing that I remember that he taught was this, be perceptive, be perceptive of the people. Don't just go in with your agenda and say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Be alert. Look around. Listen to what people are saying. Don't just make it a one-sided thing. And he would say, like, if you're to visit a a home, you might uh, notice a particular style of car. Speak about that. Or you might notice toys. If you don't see children, talk about children. He said, if you see a New York Giants flag outside, don't begin talking about the Dallas Cowboys, all right? (laughs) He's saying, be perceptive to your environment. Know your audience. And so the idea is this, and Paul is practicing that, and we'll see it today. Observe and connect. Because the goal is once we have the burden and once we've put ourselves in the place where we're around someone where we can share the gospel, we've got to be able to connect where they are with where they need to be. And so we've got to find, uh, we've got to observe and then connect. And if you connect with that person, you may be able to move them from where they are to where God would have them to be. Now, there were no toys in the front yard or flags hanging out from the house for the Apostle Paul, but he did see something. In verse 23, he noticed there was an altar to an unknown God. There was this altar uh, that was there. He says, I even found that as I was in the city. Now, we're going to see in just a moment that him picking up on this and seeing this gives him a point of reference to share the gospel. But the fact of the matter is, 
Paul took time to observe what was around him, to, to know the people with whom he was sharing. And there are two distinct groups in verse 18. These groups brought him to the Areopagus, to, to this uh, group of people uh, at Mars Hill. And, and, he, and, and these two groups, we're, we're going to look at for just a moment, the Epicureans, they followed Epicurus, who lived around 300 BC. And, and he was a philosopher. And, and his philosophy basically uh, b believed this, that the gods were remote. They believed in multiple gods. They were polytheistic and, and the gods were remote and took no interest in them. Thus, everything that happened, the Epicureans believed, was by chance. And so the goal, since we're just here by chance, or we're fortunate to be here, let's just live for the moment. Let's pursue pleasure, which means also the avoidance of pain. Let's just try to live in the moment. You probably heard the saying, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we will die. That was an Epicurean philosophy. But again, the reason that, that they adopted this was they did not believe that the multiple gods were that interested in them. Then there were the Stoics. They were the followers of Zeno, who also was around 300 B.C. And uh, they looked at God in, in a pantheistic way. Again, this, this found in, in everything. And, and they believed in fate. And they believed that fate actually... Uh, trumped God himself and that uh, fate was, was that. And so it led what? To fatalism that basically this is the lot that we've been cast. Let's just endure it. But again, this thought that really there's not a personal God they believed who cared about it. So I want you to see these two different groups had different endpoints. One said, hey, let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we'll should die. The other looked at life like going to a dentist office and was saying, let's endure, let's just get through it and seek to be as righteous as we could be. But the one thing they had in common was this, and this was important for Paul to know. Both groups did not believe in a personal God. They believed that there were gods, but they didn't believe that the gods were interested in them. And so we see here that Paul perceived what these groups believed. Paul perceived uh, the altar that was around. And then we see a fourth thing. Paul transitioned to the truth about the true God. He moved them from where they were to where they needed to be. He knew what the people understood, and the challenge he had there was to be able to communicate the gospel and the Holy Spirit to take that truth and communicate in a way that people could say, aha, I understand what you're saying. Just like a good newscaster who will segue from one segment into another, Paul needed to move them from their false religious circles into who the true God was. So going back to that altar, how did he do that? Well, he noticed first this altar to an unknown God. It would be like walking in this building and seeing an altar and it, it sticks out. And, and so he says, hey, I noticed this when I came into the city. And then brilliantly, he proceeded to use that as a point of conversation to share about the true God, follow his argument. He said, okay, you and Athenians, you even make a place for a God you do not know. So thus, it must be that you acknowledge you don't know everything there is to know. I know one you need to know, and his name is Jesus, and you need to repent and to believe in him. He's the true God. See how he used the perception of where they were to move them to where they needed to be. Now, before this point, they were confused. Remember, some of the Athenians were saying, there are two gods. There's the God Jesus and the God resurrection. They were, were so confused. They needed to be led to the person of the truth. Doesn't that sound familiar today? Don't we live in a world of confusion today? People don't know. People are adopting the newest fad, the newest thought. All of these things are going. They need people who are, who are of faith to share Christ with them. Now remember, 
These people, many were part of these two religious groups that are philosophical groups, rather the Epicureans and the Stoics. And so I want you to see how, again, Paul transitions to meet them where they are. Now remember, they had differing ends, but they shared one thing in common. They did not believe that God was a personal God who truly cared about them. And listen to what he said. He proclaims, He, Jesus, and his message is the Creator God. Notice what he says in verse 24. He made the world and everything in it. In other words, he is the Creator God. Verse 26, from one man he made every nationality. And then he moves, not only is God active and a Creator, but he is self-sufficient. He is not served by idols. He is not formed by man's hands, nor is he dependent upon man. He is separate from us. But I want you to see his third thing, and this is important. He expresses that Jesus holds history in his hands. Now imagine for the Epicureans and the Stoics, uh, they love new teaching. This was a new teaching. What? You're telling us that God is active? Yes, he is. Verse 27, he's not far from you, is what Paul says. In him we live and move and have our being. He sustains us. He awakens us. We're God's offspring. You see what he's doing here? He's taking the people and what they believed, which was false, and he's sharing the truth of the gospel with them. Jesus is living, active, interested, and all-powerful. Now, you and I probably will not ever stand before a group like the Areopagus. But the fact of the matter is, wherever we are, we need to preach Jesus. We need to know those to whom we're sharing and with whom we're sharing. And we need to segue and move the gospel that they might hear the truth of the gospel. Are you engaged in sharing with people? Are there people that you pray for regularly? God, open the door that I might share. Are you praying, God, would you stir their hearts? But I want you to see a, fi a fifth thing that led us to say that God was pleased with Paul. And that's this. Paul called for a response. He didn't just preach truth. He actually challenged the people to respond. Now, for those of you who are young and part of the digital age, there used to be things called encyclopedias. <laughs> and they were amazing. You didn't just have to push a button to get the most up-to-date information. You could buy 27 hardback <laughs> volumes, 26 for every letter of the alphabet and 27 for the index, and they could collect dust, and they had up-to-date information. Most of them, it was probably printed fewer than two years ago, maybe, if you were lucky. They were heavy. Imagine, though, back in the day, there were actually encyclopedia salespersons. They would go door to door. Now, a lot of them, they would leave the 27 volumes in the car, and maybe just bring, bring one book out. And they would try to convince you why you needed this plethora of information that you could have at your disposal, and they weren't that heavy. And so someone would come in the house, they would show you the beautiful binding, the beautiful sturdy pages, they would show you the pictures, and then they would leave. No, they didn't. <laughs> they would say, wouldn't you like to buy one? Wouldn't you like to buy a set? That's right, and a free bookcase, you got it. <laughs> Where are we going with this? When we share the gospel with people, we're not successful if we don't at least challenge or give opportunity for someone to share. A successful presentation of the gospel would say, wouldn't you respond? Notice Paul here in verse 30. Therefore, after he had shared all of that, this is where we are, he said, having overlooked the times of ignorance, these people, they were thinking Jesus and resurrection were two different gods. They, they didn't know up from down. God now commands all people everywhere to repent. In other words, now that you have heard, this is what God calls you to do, repent. These people believe wrongly. 
They were ignorant of the truths of God. They were chasing every new idea. They were giving little value to absolute truth. They were all over the place. But more than anything, what distressed Paul was they were not giving proper allegiance to the one true God. And what was his message? The way you're to respond is repent. Paul made it clear, verse 31, there's coming a day God has set that day when he's going to judge the world. And in that, it doesn't matter what stars or circles someone has placed on us. What matters is what God thinks. And God would say, did you repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? He provided proof of who Jesus was through the resurrection. And he calls us to repent and believe. So as we look at Paul here today, it tells us right at the end, verse 34, some people joined him and believed. Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Demarius, and others with them. Just a handful. Was it successful? I would say, yeah, because there were people who were saying, some ridiculed, but some said, we'd like to hear from you some more. The venue wasn't an easy venue. The venue was one where people wanted to chew on different ideas and, and pridefully would say, well, this doesn't make sense with what I heard last week or last year. But Paul was faithful to share. It began with a burden, that cue that prompted activity. It followed by him being willing to go not just within the walls of the religious, but beyond it. And it moved forward as when he went to the people, he didn't just go with a Bible in a hand trying to beat them, but he began to perceive where are these people at? What, what, what is motivating them? What is driving them? Then he transitioned to show how the gospel fit and, and, and was the answer. Jesus is the answer. And then he called for response. So I would say he was successful by God's terms. But the question for us, will we be successful? Will we have that burden? Will we go beyond these walls? Will we seek to know our neighbors, our coworkers? Will we strategically try to connect the gospel to where they are and call them to response? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you loved us enough to give us your word, to guide us into truth, and Lord, you gave us the living word, Jesus Christ. And we pray today within the sound of my voice that every person has repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, you are the creator. You're the sustainer. You're the one who loves us, who knows us better than we know ourselves. And so, Father, speak in this, these moments, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder today if you come to know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. From time to time, I have elderly people come to me and they ask, Rick, would you do my funeral? And the first thing I want to ask that person, I want to find out, do you know the Lord? Because I want to know when I do someone's funeral that they know the Lord. That's the most important thing. Do, do you know the Lord? We don't know what is going to happen in our future. Things change so quickly. I pray today that you know Jesus Christ. If not, repent and believe. He's Lord of all. Maybe you have done that in your life. Let me challenge you. Follow the example of Paul. Share with those that God places on your heart. If you don't have that burden yet, say, God, give me a burden for one person, for two persons, for a handful of people. However God would lead, he comes, we stand and sing our closing hymn, which is number 330. Grace that taught my heart to 
and grace will lead me home. Thank you. If you remain standing just a moment, we're going to uh, close out. Pray you have a blessed week. Just a few other things we want to make note of. The flowers behind me are in memory of Helen Loveday, uh, provided by the family, and they're beautiful, and we appreciate those. Also, we want to be in prayer for Lauren Showalter and her family. Her grandmother, uh, Miss Schooler, passed away. As many, many of you know, her grandfather and grandmother served on the mission field, served in pioneer areas in the U.S., and uh, she recently passed away. Funeral's going to be early in the week. Lauren will be leaving to go. It's Mississippi, right, down the deep south for that. So we want to be in prayer for their family. Again, thank you so much for being here. For those who are children and youth, we have Wednesday nights at 6. We'd love to have you come out. They have a great time. And uh, I love seeing the kids. They have so much fun. Uh,